<clears throat> thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, there was again some sort of crackling on the local mic, like somebody was opening some food thing or something. So I don't, I mean, stop now. But, uh, whatever. Hey, can see the now? Yeah. Yep. All righty. So uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, you know, excited to talk about uh, some of the more recent work that my group has been doing around misinformation. Um, and for the people that are on the Zoom, I'll drop links to papers and tweet threads and stuff in the chat box as, uh, as we go. Um, so, okay, so, you know, particularly for this crowd, misinformation, uh, the, the misinformation problem doesn't require much introduction. You know, we started, obviously falsehoods have been around forever, but we started talking about a particular flavor of uh, sort of fake news or misinformation, a lot of it online uh, during 2016 redoubled concerns uh, during the pandemic. Um, the US 2020 election had its own another round of uh, you know, blatantly false claims. And uh, what we've been doing is a lot of research and trying to understand who falls for misinformation and how to combat it. And uh, we synthesized a lot of this research in um, this review article in TICS, The Psychology of, uh, of Fake News. Um, and I feel like a lot of progress has, uh, has been made in, in this general area. But the thing that I want to uh, focus on today is the fact that the vast majority of this research has been done in the US and then some studies in the UK and Western Europe, but almost entirely, uh, you know, um, these areas. But misinformation is really a very global problem um, that, at least talking to people at social media companies, I think is actually a much larger problem in many other parts of the world. And so what we're doing in this work is trying to take a sort of more global view on the misinformation problem. <clears throat> and so we ran a study led by Antonio Arjar, um, a big collaborative project with a lot of co-authors uh, across 16 countries, 34,000 subjects. Um, in each country, we uh, restricted to people that said that they had social media accounts, but that included WhatsApp. Um, which almost everybody outside of the U.S. has. So that was not a very restrictive filter. Um, and then uh, within each country, we got uh, samples that were quota matched on age and gender to the national distribution. And, you know, they were maybe uh, more educated than average in some of the countries, but in terms of values in the World Value Survey and stuff like that, they were uh, pretty representative of the, um, of the participant or the, of the general populations in basically all the countries. So what we did within each uh, within each country is this basic design where each subject was shown a set of 10 false and 10 true statements. They're all statements about COVID, uh, which allows us to do a cross-cultural misinformation study in a way that's typically not that possible. Like if you're doing political news, every country has its own political situation. And so you have to use different headlines in every country. And so then you don't know if country differences are just due to the headline set that you chose versus actual underlying differences. So here we can use the same set of headlines uh, or statements in all countries because we picked COVID related things that are relevant everywhere. <clears throat> we had a set, a total a set of 45 statements, 30 false and 15 true. And each person saw a random subset of 10 of the false and 10 of the true. And the, head, the statements were just presented as statements without any image or any source information. And the participants were randomized into one of four conditions that I'll describe in a moment. Uh, to give you a flavor of what the statements were, here are some sample false statements. Um, so, you know, things that are actually helpful are claiming they're bad, things that are actually not helpful, claiming that they're good, uh, you know, claiming that uh, vaccines are bad, and claiming that COVID is not a big deal. Um, and some, some of the true headlines are just, you know, uh, true statements. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> in the first condition, uh, you know, a quarter of the people were randomized into the accuracy condition, where for each statement, they were asked to the best of their knowledge, uh, is the above headline accurate? And so this just gives us a sense uh, <clears throat> or window into what people believe. And if you just look at the average accuracy ratings, which I rescale, so zero means, uh, you know, they said extremely inaccurate and one means extremely accurate. This is sort of the average, average accuracy rating. In the US, we find that the true headlines are believed about twice as much as the false headlines, which lines up well with many previous studies we and other groups have run with a wide variety of headlines in the US. <clears throat> and then if you look at variation across uh, the 15 other countries, 
there's a pretty interesting pattern where there's basically no very meaningful variation across countries in how much they believe the true headlines, but there was a lot of variation across countries in how much they believe the false headlines. And now the focus of our paper is, is looking at for cross-cultural regularity. So we're gonna look for things that are true everywhere. Um, and so we don't go into a lot of trying to explain what is underlying this difference across countries in large part because 16 countries isn't actually that many countries when you're trying to look for cross-cultural differences, it's only 16 observations. Um, so I think that, you know, this is more of a saying, look, there really is holding the headline set constant. There is a lot of variation across countries and belief. Um, and that's, you know, something that should be investigated. Uh, but what I'm gonna focus on is the more individual level question of who falls for misinformation um, and to what extent does that vary across countries or are there predictors that are consistent across countries? Um, <clears throat> and we're gonna look at uh, this question using a few different perspectives. The cognitive perspective, which uh, Gord Pennypick and I have done a bunch of research on in the US and some other countries, uh, is that um, you know, a lot of the reason that people fall for false claims is because they're just not thinking enough. So when you rely on intuition, then you believe falsehoods, regardless of whether they align with their pol your politics or whatever, you're just more credulous. Um, and so to get some insight into this, we use the cognitive reflection test, this set of questions with intuitively compelling but wrong answers. We used a self-report uh, item from the need for cognition scale about how much people like thinking. And we use the just attention checks, so like how much are people paying attention? Um, and for each of these individual differences, we ran a separate model where it's like for every headline, for every rating, we predict how accurate we, the, the accuracy of that rating based on whether the headline was actually true, um, what the individual difference is and the interaction between the two. And the interaction is the critical piece because this tells you how much does the, uh, the individual difference relate to truth discernment. That is how much does it predict how good people are at telling true from false. And then we also control, include controls for age, gender, college education, and perceived relative socioeconomic status. One of these ladders, like how are you doing, how well are you doing relative to others in your society? <clears throat> and what I'm gonna show you is for each individual difference, I'm gonna show you the metalytic meta meta uh, estimate across the 16 countries for the uh, interaction between that uh, individual difference and veracity. So basically the relationship between that individual difference and truth discernment across all countries. And then we'll have one dot for each of the uh, 16 countries. So <clears throat> what you see is for the need for cognition measure, the CRT measure and the attentiveness measure, overall, they're very highly uh, significantly positively related to uh, truth discernment. And this is true in essentially every single country. So this is very robust uh, evidence of cognitive sophistication being associated with truth discernment. Um, and interestingly, these are all controlling for college, but if you look at college on its own, it's a much smaller effect and not as consistent. So it's thinking is more important than actual uh, education level. Um, and these echoes findings in the US, including causal effects where we show that um, distracting people or inducing them to rely on emotion makes them more likely to believe uh, false political claims uh, regardless of their, um, of their veracity. Uh, Stefan asks, can you get a sense of how to interpret the interaction coefficient? Um, yeah, so it's like for a one standard deviation change in the, um, <clears throat> in the individual difference, that's the number of uh, like scale points that uh, truth, that discernment increases uh, on this sort of zero to one scale. Okay, so that's a cognitive perspective. From a social perspective, uh, it says, you know, motivation is a key driver of uh, attitudes and beliefs. There's lots of non-accuracy related motivations that could drive people to have inaccurate beliefs. Um, but to the extent that people are motivated to have accurate beliefs, you might expect them to indeed have more accurate beliefs because they put more effort in or whatever. And so we asked a couple of questions about how important people think accuracy is, sort of how motivated they are to have accurate beliefs. Um, and then we also looked at just general interpersonal trust. You might think that people are, that are more trusting are gonna be more credulous and therefore more likely to uh, get tricked. Um, and what we find is that people that say that it's you know, important to only share accurate news and people that say it's important to listen to evidence over what the party tells you to do um, in all countries, 
they are better at telling truth from falsehood. Um, conversely, trust was not really associated much with uh, discernment anywhere. Um, next, uh, we looked at ideology. So, you know, in the US, there's a lot of evidence that conservatives are more susceptible to misinformation uh, than liberals. And we wanted to know whether this generalizes beyond the US. And we didn't really expect that it would, because um, it seemed like that was some particular feature of the American uh, political uh, you know, media ecosystem. Um, and we also wanted to look at other dimensions of ideology. Uh, so um, <clears throat> we looked at, we used, we used this question about individual responsibility versus government responsibility as a sort of generalizable sort of essence of conservatism. We also asked how important it was to live in a country that's governed democratically. And then we asked a couple of questions about more personal ideological values about uh, income inequality versus incentives for individual effort and a kind of moral relativism question. And then also whether people believed in God. And what we found was that <clears throat> very consistently saying that democracy was important was associated with better truth discernment. And to our surprise, in most of the countries and very significantly meta-analytically, being conservative was associated with worse truth discernment. So this was not a unique to the US, although the US was one of the strongest relationships there. Um, and sort of relatedly, maybe uh, we found consistently the belief in God, well, not totally consistently, but in most places, belief uh, in God was also associate, associated with uh, worse truth discernment. Um, whereas these other two ideological measures were uh, varied a lot across cultures. Uh, and then we also looked at demographics, um, which I won't get into much. Uh, and finally, um, <clears throat> we looked at the person's own, we ran this in uh, March and April, 2020, before uh, vaccines were widely available. So we asked how inclined were you to get a, a vaccine yourself? And how much did you think other people were gonna get the vaccine? And obviously this is just a correlation, but people that were, uh, more, more likely to get the vaccine were better at telling true from false or put differently, people that were more susceptible to COVID misinformation were less likely uh, to say they would get vaccinated. So to summarize uh, this part, we find that all of these different uh, perspectives on misinformation uh, you know, are, are showing up and are being important predictors, cognitive sophistication, uh, accuracy motivations and ideology. So, uh, you know, there's, <clears throat> Not any one is, is primary. All of these things are important, which makes sense for something that's as sort of big and multifaceted as misinformation. Uh, <clears throat> then we shifted from belief to sharing. So in the second uh, condition, people were randomized to see, the, you know, in, for each headline, instead of being asked to judge its accuracy, they are asked, if you were to see it online, how likely would you be to share it? <clears throat> and what we're going to do is we're going to compare how discerning the accuracy judgments were, that is how much more they believed the true headlines relative to the false headlines, and compare that to how discerning the sharing condition uh, responses were, that is how much more they intended to share true headlines than false headlines. So if we start with accuracy discernment, remember this is what I showed you uh, before, which is just the average, um, the accuracy judgments for true versus false headlines. And so from each of these, you calculate the discernment by saying true minus false. So you see the UK is doing really well. Um, and you see that India's truth discernment is much smaller. Um, so these, these purple ones are the, just the difference between the, the blue and red bars for accuracy. And now we wanna say, okay, let's do the same thing with sharing. What do we see there? And the, the, the horizontal bars are the meta-analytic estimates. And so what you see is pretty consistently across countries, accuracy uh, judgments are substantially more discerning than sharing judgments. On, aver on average, there are people are about twice as discerning when they're judging accuracy than they are when they're judging sharing. So it suggests that there's some really substantial disconnect between accuracy judgments and sharing intentions and sharing isn't just about accuracy which when we started this, we thought of sharing as just a behavioral measure of accuracy judgments, but that is really clearly not true. And so um, as you may know, and as we heard from Tatiana earlier, um, a major uh, explanation <clears throat> that's been put forth uh, by our group about why um, accuracy judgments are more discerning than sharing judgments is that when you're thinking about sharing, particularly on social media, uh, you're you're not thinking about accuracy. The like the the social media context 
directs your attention to all of these social concerns. Like if I share it, what's it gonna look like? Who's gonna like it? How much engagement is it gonna get? Stuff like that. And so people forget to even stop and think about, is it accurate or not? And so if this is right, then getting people to consider accuracy should make their sharing more discerning. And um, uh, to investigate this, we used a sort of accuracy prompt that is the one that we've used uh, the most often. Um, so in another uh, quarter of the people were randomly assigned to the prompt condition, where the first thing that they did at the beginning of the study before they know anything else about what the study's about is we asked them to pre-test a headline for a future study. We want to know whether it's accurate or not. We show them one non-COVID related headline. We have a few different ones that we randomly sampled from, ask them to rate how accurate it is, and then they go on to do the same thing as the sharing condition where for the 20 COVID headlines, they say whether they would share it or not. And we look at how rating the accuracy of this one headline at the outset affects um, <clears throat> how discerning their subsequent sharing is. And uh, we've done a lot of these experiments in the US. Um, we had a paper that's out today actually in Nature Communications um, where we show, we do like an internal meta-analysis of, um, 20 different experiments and 26,000 American participants. Um, and we find that prompting uh, participants to think about accuracy at the beginning of the study um, successfully increases sharing discernment. It works for uh, political headlines that are aligned with your politics and that aren't. It works for COVID headlines. It works for both conservatives and liberals. It works for a wide variety of headlines and a wide variety of different ways of prompting people uh, to think about accuracy. Tatiana showed a nice, another uh, replication, uh, conceptual replication of this and extension earlier, um, showing how you know there's really a lot of different ways uh, to do this. Um, and we also found that the effect lasted for the full duration of the experimental session. So that was great uh, from the US. And what we wanted to know in the cross-cultural study is how does this effect vary across countries? So now what I'm gonna show you is um, the effect of, the, of prompting people to think about accuracy on sharing discernment. So this is gonna say sharing discernment uh, after being prompted, sorry, sharing discernment for the people that were prompted minus sharing discernment for people in the control. And then we show it as a percentage. So we divide by um, sharing discernment in the control. And what you see is the meta-analytic estimate is highly significant. It's about, on average, about a little less than a 20% increase in sharing discernment. Um, but there also is a lot of variation across countries. There's some places where it works really well. There's some people where it works, places where it works middling. There's some places where it doesn't uh, work. There's nowhere where it's significantly negative. Um, <clears throat> and so we want to try and understand this variation across countries. Uh, particularly because there's a clear theoretical uh, prediction about uh, why the effect should vary across countries. Which is, remember, when I was talking about uh, this is comparing the accuracy condition and the sharing condition and their level of discernment, we said on, accu on average, accuracy discernments are a lot more, uh, sorry, accuracy judgments are a lot more discerning than sharing judgments. But this varies across countries. Like in the UK, there's this really big disconnect. Um, whereas, you know, in India, there's not that much of a disconnect. Uh, or in Egypt, there's not that much of a disconnect. And so <clears throat> if what the prompt is doing is getting people to think about accuracy when they're making sharing judgments, uh, what, they, what the prompt should be doing is moving the orange dots up towards the purple dots. And so in places where there was a big disconnect in the first place, you should get a big return from the prompt. Whereas in places that there wasn't that much of a disconnect, you shouldn't get as much of a return for the prompt. And so what I'm gonna show you is one dot per country where the x-axis shows you just like the, the difference between the purple and orange bars here. And then the y-axis is the effect of, uh, of the prompt on sharing discernment. And you see this very strong correlation across countries where countries where there's a big disconnect, so there's a sort of big baseline problem, the prompt helps a lot. Uh, and countries where there's less of a problem, the prompt uh, helps less. Uh, and then we also wanted to look very to a variation across headlines. This again uh, speaks a little bit to one of the questions that came up during Tatiana's talk. Um, and so here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show one dot per headline and I'm gonna show 
the accuracy rate, the average accuracy rating for that headline in the accuracy condition. And I'm going to show the average uh, effect of the accuracy prompt on sharing intentions for that headline. And so the red headlines are the false ones, the blue headlines are the true ones. And what you can see is that within the false headlines, there's variation in how implausible they are. And among the true headlines, there's variation in how plausible they are. And that variation pretty much perfectly explains the effect uh, of the accuracy prompt, which is the crazier the headline seems, <clears throat> the more you get a reduction in sharing when you uh, prompt people to stop and think about accuracy. Uh, so that's the, um, that's the accuracy condition. Uh, <clears throat> and then finally, uh, we also had a, a tips condition where we give some minimal digital literacy tips. We think that these tips in our context are largely uh, functioning by just also prompting accuracy, but in a bit more indirect way. Uh, and indeed, we find a significant uh, positive effect uh, across countries from the tips and no significant variation across countries in the tip size. So the confidence interval for each estimate, for the estimate in every country pretty much is overlapping with the, um, with the average. So this is a lot of evidence from survey experiments uh, that these kinds of interventions can increase the quality of the, of the news that people share. Um, and, uh, but of course, we wanna see if this actually works in the real world. Um, so we also have another paper where uh, we um, actually did a Twitter field experiment. And so in this paper, we created a set of um, bot accounts um, that were ex explicitly identified themselves as bots and were non-political, they were cooking bots, is what the grad student who I put in charge of this decided to make them. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, we, with these bots, we followed uh, over 130,000 Twitter users who had shared links to Breitbart or Infowars, uh, right-leaning sites that produce a lot of misinformation. Um, of those, about 11,000 of them followed us back and so now those are people that we can send private messages to. Uh, within that, we went through and we eliminated uh, accounts that looked like they were bots themselves or that hadn't been posting anything uh, recently. And so we wound up with a little over 5,000 subjects who were um, didn't know they were in our experiment, but they were following our accounts. And so then we could send them um, uh, <clears throat> messages to deliver a sort of private treatment. And so what we did is we used a treatment that was this basically the same thing as what we did in the survey experiments, where we say, how accurate is this headline? We show them some random non-political headline and we say, hey, you know, how accurate is it? <clears throat> basically, nobody responds to the message fewer than 10%, but that's fine. We don't need them to respond to the message. All we need them to do is read the headline and they've been treated in the sense that the concept of accuracy has been activated in their mind. Um, and in order to do true real causal inference on this, we randomize who gets the message on which day. And so then every day is its own mini experiment where you can compare the people who got messaged on that day, what they shared afterwards to what uh, everyone who hasn't gotten the message yet shared. And the idea is when they click out of this and go back to their feed, they'll be more likely to think, be thinking about accuracy. And so they'll share higher quality content. And indeed, that's what we find. We find a significant increase in the quality of the links that are shared. Um, and to give some sense of uh, how that effect works, what I'm showing you here is one dot per news source. The size of the dot is proportional to the uh, pre-treatment uh, tweeting. So you see these people mostly shared Fox News and Breitbart. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, on the y-axis, you have the quality of the news source as judged by fact checkers. And on the x-axis, uh, sorry, x-axis is quality of the news as judged by fact checkers. Y-axis is the change in the fraction of tweets um, that contained links to those, uh, those sources. And you see this strong positive correlation such that the treatment increased the alignment between what people were sharing and what the fact checkers said were high quality content. And so the implication is while you're scrolling through your feed, every, you know, the social media could, uh, platforms could pop up little accuracy reminders where they'd say, hey, help us inform our algorithms. How accurate do you think it is? And they could just throw away the responses and just asking the question would increase the quality of what people uh, share. So we're academics, we write papers about this stuff. Um, here are the first couple, although we have a bunch uh, at this point. Um, but we also really want to try to have impact. So we've been working with tech companies 
For example, TikTok uh, read about our research, did some of their own internal experiments based on it and concluded that it was good and built it into their platform. We've been working with people at Jigsaw for a few years on trying to, uh, um, Jigsaw is a unit at Google, uh, to try to develop this into a, a platform that, or a set of tools that um, tech companies can use. And we've had a lot of discussions with people at Facebook and Twitter who internally are, you know, sort of working on these sorts of things. It's also something that's not only in the hands of the tech companies, um, where you can uh, deliver it yourself with ads. So during the 2020 election, we worked with a nonprofit that um, paid a design firm to make a series of ads based on our research. They paid to put those ads on disinformation sites, and they found that they got way more engagement and traction than normal persuasive political ads. Um, and so they decided to put a lot of money in it. And during the Georgia runoffs in the 2020 elections, um, they got like over 64 million views in four weeks. Um, <clears throat> and we have survey experiments that suggest that these ads should reduce uh, uh, misinformation sharing. And we have some new experiments that um, we had a 30,000 person pilot uh, and we're currently analyzing the data from the 80,000 person real experiment uh, where we, we ourselves targeted users with ads on Twitter and then looked at what they subsequently shared. And in the pilot, we find a significant decrease um, in the number of links to fake news sites or to, mis to like low quality sites broadly defined including you know, hyperpartisan sites and so on, you get a decrease in the number of uh, links to low quality sites uh, that they share. So it seems like it's sort of broadly, uh, broadly applicable. Um, and finally, the last thing I wanna say is that, you know, I was saying that we could just ask uh, how accurate or inaccurate um, are these random headlines and throw away the answers and that would be good because it would um, help get people to think about accuracy. But the final question we wanted to know is should people actually throw away or should the platforms throw away these answers or might they actually be helpful at identifying misinformation in a scalable way? Because third party fact checkers are great. I'm a big fan of fact checking. Um, the problem is it just doesn't really scale. There's not very many professional fact checkers. It takes a long time and a huge amount of co content is posted every day. And so the question is, can you use the wisdom of crowds <clears throat> to help identify misinformation uh, at scale. And so we did an initial look at this in the US where we partnered with Facebook. They gave us a set of URLs that their internal algorithms had flagged as things they wanted fact checks on, either because they had reason to believe they might be inaccurate or just because they were going viral or about important topics. And then we hired three professional fact checkers to read each article in detail and do research and conclude how accurate it was. And we also recruited about 1,100 people uh, from Mechanical Turk to just read the headline and the lead sentence and say how accurate they thought it was. And then we asked how well the fact checker research lined up with the crowd ratings. And so I'm going to show you the correlation between the headline ratings from the crowd and the research, the fact checker research ratings here. <clears throat> they're using one to seven Likert scales. And we're going to look at how well that uh, <clears throat> the crowd agrees with the fact checkers as a function of the size of the crowds, so like the number of people rating each headline. We also varied whether we told them the domain that the news came from or not. And as our baseline, we're going to take the correlation between the fact checkers, because although there was broad agreement among the fact checkers, the correlation in their ratings was far from one. And we wouldn't expect the crowd to be too much better than the fact checkers themselves. And what we find is with maybe 15 or 20 lay people per headline, uh, you're getting the crowd agreeing with the fact checkers as much as the fact checkers agree with each other. So it suggests that crowdsourcing can work. Here it's, uh, <clears throat> it was equally well or maybe even a little bit better for political headlines versus non-political headlines. And then in the big cross-cultural study, we also wanted to replicate uh, to see if, if the, um, the uh, crowd could identify COVID related misinformation and if this worked outside of the US. So we use the ratings from the accuracy condition to say how well can we predict which headlines are accurate versus inaccurate using the average accuracy ratings, again, as a function of how big the crowd is for all the different countries. <clears throat> and what we see is that everywhere, basically, with maybe 20 people per headline, you're doing pretty well. Everywhere they're getting an AUC of greater than uh, 0.85, almost everywhere they're doing better than 0.9. <clears throat> and so it suggests that this, even though maybe it works slightly better in the US and the UK than most of the other countries, and pretty much everywhere it's doing very well. So, uh, you know, this suggests that it's something that should work generally. Um, Facebook is using it. 
uh, you know, Birdwatch is working on this and so on. So just to wrap, um, we see striking regularities in, psycho uh, in the psychology of misinformation and intervention effectiveness uh, across countries. Cognitive, social, and ideological factors all seem uh, relevant for predicting um, truth discernment. And sharing is less discernment is less discerning than accuracy judgments everywhere, although the extent of that varies. Um, and we find that interventions developed in the U.S happily do seem to generalize pretty broadly. And that includes shifting attention to accuracy and digital literacy tips can increase the quality of what people share and crowdsourcing can help people identify uh, low quality information. And these both offer scalable approaches that don't rely on a centralized authority deciding what to censor. So maybe there are things that Elon Musk uh, would you know, still be willing to do. Um, and uh, so you know, this is what we've been doing recently. And I feel like the big thing uh, for future work is trying to understand how viral uh, misinformation, which I feel like is what a lot of researchers have been focusing on, compares to elite-based misinformation, uh, like sort of top-down coordinated misinformation can campaigns from trusted sources, which I feel like is a lot of what's happening uh, around the world and in the US now and how that's different. So uh, thanks everyone. Uh, for listening. Thanks to all the people that uh, I collaborate with, including Antonio, who's the lead, and the people that gave us money. And a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Yes. So we have uh, not so much time, but maybe for a couple of questions. <clears throat> yes, I was very interested, uh, this is Maria Bagrami and uh, in Peritia, we also try to do a limited amount of cross-cultural comparison and analysis. I was very interested in that aspect of uh, your research as well as other aspects, fascinating stuff. Uh, but how, how, how do you measure something like plausibility across cultures? Because uh, what, what may seem very plausible to an Indian reader may not be plausible at all to an English reader. Right, I mean, that's, that's, that's the point of the accuracy condition, essentially, is we just ask, I mean, I guess to us, we think of plausibility and accuracy ratings as more or less interchangeable, where what we mean is like, uh, what you said is right, that essentially the false claims on average seem much more plausible to the Indian readers than to the UK readers, for example. Um, and so it's just something that we measure empirically in the study. But, but uh, do, you, do you think that there can be comparisons between the UK and, and, and if, 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 in terms of what makes sense to a reader, would it, shouldn't that be involved in, in the comparison? Uh, I guess to me, that's, that's like the thing that we are trying to measure in some sense. That is like, that, that is the, 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 the outcome of interest. Yes, uh, I had a question on the findings about education that you showed uh, in the cross country study. Um, so you seem to say that um, education is, yes, thank you, um, is less of, um, like impactful or less related than, uh, for example, analytical thinking. Um, I was wondering where the samples that you used a um, from a representative, uh, like were they representative from the uh, countries and the populations? And yeah, so the, as I as I mentioned, they are quota matched on age and gender, so they're representative on age and gender. Um, <clears throat> in some countries, the level of education is substantially higher than the general uh, public. Um, but in terms of uh, like ideology, for example, there was a good match on these the four ideology measures we used between the World Values Survey, which is really representative, and what we found in our data. So it's not perfectly representative, but it's maybe more representative than I uh, than I had expected. You know, it's like a limitation that obviously we're um, we're recruiting people to do web surveys. So they're not, you know, that already is going to reduce the representativeness because it's only the people that are, you know, willing to or able to do web surveys. Um, and, you know, I think that's just like a sort of natural constraint on this kind of work. And so, you know, that the, clearly one of the, the, the major limitations here is that the samples are not like really representative. Okay, thank you. Really? So thank you, Lily. Um, thanks again.
And, and I'm happy to answer questions in the chat for people that didn't have time for um, asking verbally.